His, his topic today, though, without further ado, is uh, studying the entry, atmospheric entry of uh, the Medley uh, space station into the Mars atmosphere. And it's a two-phase project. And uh, I was unable to advise him during the fall semester. So um, Colonel Blandino graciously uh, agreed to do that. And uh, they worked second half was taking actual um, data from the Mars lander that was transmitted back to Earth uh, from within the heat shield, studying the effects of the uh, heating and uh, trying to parse out the amount of ablation that might have taken place. In other words, the amount of material that was worn or burned off of the surface of the heat shield. So um, without further ado, I'll let him Results and then a conclusion uh, accounting for everything that was accomplished during this research. So, the, the main focus of the heat shield analysis was entailed with the Mars Medley Program, which stands for Mars Entry, Descent, and Landing Instrument. The project was unique in the fact that this heat shield was actually fitted with various sensors and for the first time was really able to gauge atmospheric conditions as well as analyze the overall performance of the heat shield. However, um, while Medley was a success, it was a part of the Curiosity program, and today probably all of you have seen in the news Curiosity and all of the work that it's been doing for NASA. Um, the ablation sensors that were fitted with Medley had actually failed during its entry period. Now, the temperature values that were collected from Medley were, uh, all of those were still accounted for, and that data was saved. So through this method of temperature analysis, we're able to analyze the heat conduction from an inverse method. So the goals of this research, given this background, is to 
incorporate a full investigation of Bentley and try and have this complete analysis. And as Captain McMasters mentioned, analyzing the heating of this shield can be seen from two different standpoints, external and internal. The first part was looking at the external model. And this first involved um, three main goals of analyzing a Martian and analyzing and building a Martian atmosphere from which the analysis could be conducted. Then analyzing Medley's traje trajectory over the descent phase. And then looking at this trajectory and seeing how the PT flux could be analyzed from this data. From the internal perspective, as Kevin McMasters had mentioned, we actually did have measured data. And as a result, we would be able to look at that and determine the amount of ablation that was created from the uh, descent of the Medley heat shield. And I'll go a little more in depth with the terms of ablation and PT flux and what those mean. In addition, we'll be identifying the thermal parameters, and these were mainly used to optimize the PT flux and analysis. And then from that, finally determine the PT flux from every temperature residual flow. The benefits of this research is that this will go towards a greater understanding of heat shield performance and will help to influence the future designs. Certainly, um, it would be very expensive for NASA to continuously have a to do a trial and error method of heat shield analysis. So this computer modeling goes towards the aims that if we can incorporate ablation, understand the burning of this heat shield and the properties as it's descending through the Mars atmosphere, that a uh, better cost-effective design can be incorporated in the future. So beginning with the external analysis. The first part was trying to design a Martian atmosphere. And what was rather difficult was trying to find data that was capture, captured from Medley. So with the work of Colonel Blandino, we had been looking for some sort of literature and from the analysis of Viking 1, we were able to see something with uh, the factors needed, including temperature, pressure, density, and speed of sound. And it was chosen to use Viking 1 as it was an ideal model that it had landed in a similar spot to where Medley had, and also at the same time frame. So Viking 1's analysis was sort of set as the standard analysis for a, it's a standard day atmospheric conditions at, in Mars. And the graph, oh. the graph shown here is <coughs> some empirical modeling showing um, some calculated values that were able to be inputted for our analysis. So the next step, once that atmosphere was set and those conditions, those parameters were defined, was looking at the trajectory of the heat shield. And the reason this was important was during our initial understanding of planetary entry, we knew that there was going to be some correlation between the speed of the capsule and the heat flux. So actually we, upon further readings in ballistic aerodynamic entry, we were able to notice that there were some certain factors, um, as you can see here, that define the, that sort of, that um, define the parameters of the Mars module and affect the speed. And as a result, it would also affect the change in height. And these final equations um, through the literature proved to be the best method for the analysis of our Medley module. This is documenting the overall progress of charting Viking 1. The graph here on the right shows what was uh, a mathematical model derived from NASA showing the entry of Medley, or of Viking 1. And this was the initial graphs. As you can see, nothing really similar. Um, the change in speed didn't really have this initial constant um, constant speed coming in and then gradual descent. However, uh, from those 
equations that were used in the previous slide, we're able to see something that is much similar. And the method that we use to construct by V1 comes from this Runge-Kutta iterative model with the set time step. So once the speed, the change in speed and change in height were defined, we were then able to look at the heat flux. And it was from our literature, we were seeing this uh, defined sudden and graves method, which incorporated this factors uh, with the velocity, density, the nose radius, as well as this K constant, which defined, it depended on what planet the vehicle was entering. So for Mars, we assumed largely a carbon dioxide atmosphere and incorporated that into analyzing our stagnation heat and wave. Overall, uh, from this data, we found that it's approximating a, heat, a peak heating flux of 22 watts per centimeter squared. And this was pretty close to what was found in the literature of 24 watts per centimeter squared. Now, once this was all formulated, the next step was transitioning it to Medley and seeing how close our mathematical modeling was to the simulations performed by NASA. And all that was done was uh, redefining the parameters based off of Medley, such as the coefficient of drag, the cross-sectional area, and then just putting it into the same program that we, we had used for Viking 1. And we see that there's some great similarities in the fact that it has this constant uh, change in speed at about 5,600 meters per second, and then this gradual descent coming back down to landing. Um, and then I noticed that at the end here, there is a rather faster descent of uh, rate of change of speed. And we believe that that was because of the fact that Medley had a, um, had a deployed drag chute and other, and um, these factors of drag and friction, we weren't able to necessarily analyze. Um, but overall, the model is very, very close. And we even see here with the stagnation heating rate, it approximates about 196 watts per centimeter squared. And with our mathematical modeling, we were able to get that pretty close. Another factor of error is within that time, um, the heat flux is represented in this red curve and you can see here that it, the heat flux ends a little bit earlier than the uh, mathematical model used from NASA. However, we once again think that those factors of drag that we weren't able to account for may contribute to that longer time for entry. So the final conclusions uh, for the external components of this heat flux data is at the lee side shoulder, which is the very edge of this med, uh, of the medley heat shield, we found the max heat flux to, or the peak heat flux to be 196 watts per centimeter squared. Other factors, however, that weren't accounted for in the external was that NASA did not incorporate the conditions affecting the phenolic impregnated carbon ablator. Sounds complex. All that is is the coating that was put on the surface of the medley capsule. And that was the material that ablated or burned up in the atmosphere. In addition, uh, a study conducted by the American Institution of Aeronautics and Astronautics determined that in that data of 196 watts per centimeter squared, there was about 50% error um, that contributed to the baseline heating. And as I mentioned before, <coughs> further improvements would to be to incorporate friction and um, drag factors into the model. Now switching over to the internal analysis. The first part was analyzing the data that was come in. So for each plug, we see that there are temperatures defined at varying thicknesses throughout the plug. And as you can see, the deeper that the material, the deeper that the thermocouple is in the plug, the less that the temperature is, and that is because of the thickness of the material and the thermal conductivity properties associated with it. So the next part was matching this data and um, 
looking at it first without factoring the ablation that we know occurred. As you can see here, this curve uh, represents residuals, which are the, measure, the, the uh, calculation between the measured and the calculated data from the inverse conduction method. And as you can see here, the differences between what was calculated and what was measured ran very large, almost up to about 80 degrees Celsius and down to negative 60. Now, I want to give credit here to the class of 2018. They had done some research on this and had found that the ablation of this PICA material that I had discussed has to be contributed to, op to further optimize the model. And from this curve, this is showing that at a set temperature, there is suddenly uh, ablation that happens and it's at a constant rate here. So we knew going in that when we're defining ablation, it's going to be at a set temperature, and then it's going to have a constant rate as it goes above that, temp uh, that temperature through the entry process. Further modifications to apply the enhanced data included the sensitivity coefficients, and these sensi sensitivity coefficients sort of model how trying to optimize one aspect of the data is effective. So in this, in this curve here, this is the modification of one heat flux value at 1%. And we can see that it affects the temperature just by about a factor of two. Now, when this is applied to the ablation, uh, temperature ablation and ablation rate, we can see that it actually drastically affects that, these curves. It goes up to almost a factor of 60 and down to negative 40 and then to 50, down to about negative 125. So that gave a greater understanding as to when we're modifying these temperature of ablation properties, it's gonna have a more radical effect on our analysis and optimization. Now, these, this data was given, provided by NASA, and it sets up mathematical mo modeling for the uh, thermal properties, including thermal conductivity represented by K and volumetric heat capacity that is represented by uh, rho C. And these original property values combined with the ablation proved for a pretty effective model that was able to optimize the heat flux. H however, we had determined from uh, readings in literature that the equations that these equations provided for, or at least what we initially anticipated was that we would see some further reduction. And both factored uh, temperature input, and this to the right shows a sampling of what was in our Excel program, and the factors of heat conductivity, the volumetric heat capacity, and the temperature of ablation and ablation coefficient. Um, so, in, in a recap of all the parameters we've used, we've, we're trying to optimize all of these values along with the changing heat flux during entry to try and minimize the uh, residuals for our model. So, with what was incorporated from our understanding of the literature and other optimization methods, we're, we see an overall improvement for every plug that we have tested. And this is the initial data for what was with no ablation. And we see those large standard deviation of residuals. Once again, that is that difference between that calculated temperature and what was actually measured. So we're seeing some rather large differences. When we formulated with the thermal parameters that were given by NASA, we see a great amount of improvement However, when we use what was found in the literature and applied with the further optimization methods, we see even a greater improvement, in, um, especially within plug one, plug six. Um, even while it's minimal in four, there's still some improvement that was made. And uh, this is a sampling from one of the plugs. So this goes back to what I discussed with the first one. We see this great amount with no ablation 
visual differences. This is with the NASA thermal properties, and this is what with what was applied from our personal optimization. Now from this data, once we had formulated the change in heat flux, the, that heat that's affecting the, the shield as it's coming through the atmosphere, we were able to then look at the data and see where is the peak heat flux across each plug. And it's really neat to notice how this data is very similar to what we're seeing from the expected heat performance on the shield as it's coming through entry. So for, for heat plugs two and three, for example, we see the higher heat flux, peak heat flux values of 43 and 41 watts per centimeter squared. And we see here on the top, this is plug two and three, and that is in this hotter region. Whereas for a plug such as plug one at the lower <coughs> end, and plug four at the really lower end of about 32.47, these seem to match up and show promising results as to what was expected for the heat performance of the shield. In addition, given that, that ablation rate that was applied, we were able to determine the amount of the material that was ablated. The original coating of PICA material was about 2.54 millimeters thick. And after the final analysis, we were able to determine the amount of ablation around each of these sensors. And as well in two and three, we see that there was a greater amount of ablation due to those higher heat flux rates. So for further improvement on this, on the data and residual models, uh, a, fo a greater focus would be used on enhancing our visual basic code on Excel and trying to optimize the, our thermal output and optimizing our model using um, basically trying to re-perform or redesign the code so that it could be able to take the data and optimize it on its own. Everything that was performed uh, over the course of the research was manual input. So applying those sensitivity coefficients, applying that change in temperature, that was just all input. And it took hours of time. But if we could get the code to do it, then that would lead to faster and probably some better results. The other um, factor was noticing this trend in the heat fluxes, which changed and were, were fitted with these cubic spline values. So these values of Q were set at every four seconds. And when modifying our heat flux, these critical cues would be modified and then the data would actually fit based off of the positioning of these Q values. So further experimenting and alteration of these critical Q values would help, and, and modeling of these cubic spline fits would help to further optimize our model. Now just a summary of what was performed. On the external side, a model was developed that was when given with those parameters of our spacecraft and the initial, initial entry velocity was able to accurately chart the descent of the model. And from that, we were able to determine the stagnation heat flux and determine the peak heat flux value. The model when uh, fully developed was then with our Viking 1 program was then set to medley and showed very similar results to what was estimated with from NASA. And both, simulate, and both simulated models, while they do match up, had some error as it wasn't able to account for that ablation. And on an internal perspective, we first collected that temperature data from the sensor plugs to conduct inverse heat, uh, a inverse heat conduction analysis and modify the model to then incorporate ablation and use those thermal parameters that were discussed in the literature. Across each residual, there was improvement. The peak heat flux was determined, and the amount of pica that was ablated was then determined from those heating values. Once again, um, this project was, wasn't possible without everyone who had supported me, and quite frankly, the, the last four years of my cadetship. So this is just a brief thank you to, um, to a small portion of people in my life who made such a big difference. With that, um, what questions 
Yes, sir. If you were in 